So um, we have a very simple chart here taken from uh, economic data compiled for the United States. And it shows investments in the tangible part of the economy over a long period of time, from almost the end of World War II until 2009, the last year for which data was available. And it shows that over that time, there was a pretty steady level of investment in tangible assets, factories, railroad cars, airplanes, and so on, of about 10% of GDP. Now, um, contrast that with the rise of the investment in intangible assets. It has risen from about 4% of GDP till quite recently more like 12% of GDP. And very interestingly here, in the middle of um, the, the 1990s, that in a level of investment crossed over. The level of investment in intangible assets exceeded the level of investment in intangible assets. So I'm not exaggerating when I, when I say that now intangible assets are more important to developing wealth than tangible assets. A um, couple of uh, relevant notes to, uh, to back that up. Um, one of the key U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis began classifying software as an investment about 15 years ago. Um, a few years ago, intellectual property accounted for about half the market value a variety of technology companies in software, telecommunications, and in pharmaceuticals. And last but not least, this year, 2013, for the first time, the United States recognized research and creative works as uh, forms of investment and recalculated the total of GDP from 1929, the beginning of the, uh, the Great Depression, to the present. And the result was that GDP rose by more than 3% over the total. In other words, GDP had been undercounted because intangible assets had not been included in the total. So what are some common examples of intangible assets? And it's important that we understand the distinctions, the various types of intangible assets, because when I get to the heart of my talk today, how we go about valuing intangible assets, we'll notice that different types of intangible assets are valued very differently. Um, one example that's going to be obvious to everybody is brand. And you can see on the screen a number of brands that are instantly identifiable to you. You need only look at them and you know the names of the companies, you know a variety of attributes associated with those companies. Another example is uh, design. Here are uh, two, two uh, prominent examples. Um, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know the, uh, the iconic Apple iPhone with its signature white uh, headset. And then you'll know the very blank page that comprises the Google search page. Um, customer relationships. Um, they may take many forms. They may be short term, they may be long term. I'll talk about the distinction between those two a little later. But we, they are one of the most common and most valuable intangible assets. Uh, technology. Um, I left this till a little later because it was almost too obvious. But the development of uh, integrated circuits, of software to run on those circuits, of digital content to be displayed using that software. All of these constitute elements of technology which have significant value. <laughs> the workforce, the people who actually do the creativity, who design things, who put them together, and so on. And um, before, again, I get into describing how these things are valued, let's quickly go through how they're commercialized and protected. I'm going to talk in fairly universal terms. I'm not talking specifically about US law or European law under the Berne Convention or law of any other country. I'm just going to talk in very general terms. Um, and I'm not going to be anywhere near as specific as the last speaker about that. The most obvious way to protect a piece of developed technology is to file a patent, first of all, in the country of origin and then in other countries. And um, there have been a number of conventions developed over time for enforcement of patents across different jurisdictions. Patents have a finite life, typically about 20 years, but within that finite life, they still obviously have value. Copyrights, these could apply to books, to videos, to movies, things displayed on uh, YouTube. And again, they have a life. In this case, the life is uh, the life of, lifetime of the creator plus 70 years, so that could run a very long time. When you go back to uh, the Walt Disney creations, Walt Disney didn't die until the 1960s, 
So Walt Disney has exclusive ownership of those properties for 70 years after that. Uh, trademarks and copyrights. Um, the, uh, the most common notations you'll see on products are the TM and the SM for trademark and service mark. And that is from uh, the, 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 the originator of that content can simply put those marks on that content and make it his or hers. The R, the registration, is a little more difficult to obtain and a little more easy to enforce. Um, one method of protecting intellectual property intangible assets that is very commonly overlooked is simply to keep it secret. Um, as I explained earlier, the other forms of protection in many cases have uh, finite lives. They end at some point. In the case of the patents, it's after 20 years. So to take the most famous example, think of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has never revealed its secret formula. It keeps it in a safe in its headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. Um, only a handful of people know it. And that's true of many other forms of uh, intangible assets as well. They're kept secret. They're, um, the companies make reasonable efforts to protect the value by um, imposing non-disclosure or confidentiality requirements on employees and on partners. And by doing so, they essentially have an infinite life or as long as the technology or the asset underneath it has value. And um, this is a very commonly applied method of protecting intangible assets. Trade dress. Um, this is a little hard to see on the screen, but even without the name of the originator of this product, the Tiffany Diamond Company, many people will recognize the distinctive blue box and the white ribbon. And this can be protected just as much as can be something that can be patented or copyrighted. Customer relationships. And I'm going to distinguish between short-term customer relationships, for example, at the corner, um, in a store, at the counter, or long-term relationships, supply contracts, perhaps with a, a manufacturer and a, uh, a distributor or a retailer. And those agreements could run for many years instead of for the few minutes that the relationship at the counter took. Uh, domain names and uh, URLs from the internet. Um, these have value. These have very significant value, as I'll show you a little later in my presentation. It's not just a simple name with some initials after it. And uh, finally, a skilled workforce, as I described earlier. Um, the last category of intangible asset I have um, marked with a question mark. And that's because it's known as goodwill, and it's all of the sorts of intellectual property, intangible assets that cannot be defined. So the categories which I listed for you a few minutes ago are what are called identifiable intangible assets, and goodwill is the remainder, it's what's left over, and it's the unidentifiable intangible assets. And it has real value, and um, as I'll show you a little later, it shows up in many calculations. So getting to the heart of the presentation, how are intangible assets valued? And I'm going to apologize in advance that a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today is highly technical, and there will be some numbers on the screen for those of you who uh, don't particularly like numbers. But I'll go through them quickly, and there'll be no exam afterwards. So every valuation is a derivation of one of three approaches. The one that's most commonly used is an income approach. And this takes a financial forecast and it discounts the cash flows back to the present to arrive at what's called a net present value. Another approach that many people will have seen at one point or another in their business is a so-called market approach. And this compares the value of the asset we're trying to value today to the value of other assets in the marketplace, values that we know already. So the simplest example here would be to compare the trading value of uh, a share of stock of Google with how it traded on uh, the exchange in the United States that same day. And the final approach is known as the cost or the asset approach. And that is, uh, in summary, what, what would it cost to replicate this asset? How much would it cost to build this asset up, up from, from scratch? So let's go through each of the categories that I described to you a little earlier and uh, talk about how each of them is valued. Patents are typically valued using an income approach or a market approach. 
Here, I'm showing you a market approach. And remember when I said uh, a market approach looks at other transactions. We're going to look at uh, a number of transactions and what they tell us about the value of patents in a particular sector. You may recall from the press that a few years ago, the big Canadian telecommunications company, Nortel, went through bankruptcy proceedings when it became financially insolvent. And the, um, the bankruptcy manager held an auction in US bankruptcy court to auction off its assets. And various operating businesses went to various operating companies. The patent portfolio, which held more than 6,000 telecommunications patents, was deemed to be so valuable that it was auctioned off separately. And um, there were a couple of different bidders. There, on the one hand, there was a consortium that included um, some well-known technology companies. On the other hand was Google doing it alone, going it alone. Now, Google turned 15 today. And in um, the life of Silicon Valley companies, that may seem old, but in the life of technology companies generally in the United States, that's quite young. And one consequence of Google being so young when this auction took place a few years ago is that Google did not yet have a big patent portfolio. And it was being sued right, left, and center by other companies for so-called patent infringement. So Google was very anxious to get its hands on these Nortel patents. Not particularly because it needed the patents in its day-to-day -day business, but as a way of defending itself against the litigation that was coming at it from a lot of different sources. And Google took the attitude that it had so much money and so much clout that no one was likely to oppose it, and it put down a bid for Nortel. And then much to its surprise, it learned that this consortium of a group of companies had come together quietly in an unknown and stealthy fashion and uh, trumped the bid. So uh, about four or five companies paid $4.5 billion, which as you can see from the screen, worked out to about US uh, $750,000 per patent. That perplexed Google because it still didn't have its patent portfolio, and now some of its opponents in the marketplace had very strong patents that they could continue to press Google on. So Google did something very unexpected. It turned around and it bought uh, Motorola. And um, this was, a, as I said, unexpected because Google had not previously been in the hardware business. Um, in the process, they acquired an even larger patent portfolio, 17,000 patents. They paid about $12.5 billion, which worked out to US dollars, 735,000 per patent. And they also got an operating company, which I think they're still trying to figure out what they're gonna do with. Um, there were some other transactions that took place in the aftermath of that. AOL had amassed a number of patents over time, and uh, Microsoft stepped up and bought about 650 of those for $550 million um, for a transaction value per patent of US $846,000. That represented the high watermark because quite recently, the famous phot photography company Kodak also went through bankruptcy proceedings and uh, its patent portfolio was auctioned off. There were um, 1,100 or so patents that were worthwhile in that portfolio. And this time everybody seemed to have learned something from the Nortel fiasco because there was a consortium of about 12 companies including Apple, Samsung, Google, Huawei, RIM, BlackBerry, Microsoft, uh, and a host of others that paid um, a little more than a half million US dollars, 525 million US dollars. And you can see that the value per patent had dropped very, uh, very uh, strongly during this, um, this several year period to now US uh, $477,000 per patent. If you were attempting to value a single patent or more likely a patent portfolio, this and a lot more data would be useful. You would go through an exercise in which you look at the patent portfolio you have and the remaining lives. Remember I said that a patent has a life of about 20 years. And, um, and look at the, how key those patents were. And basically through a process, a much more detailed process than my very simple example, come up with an estimate of value for a patent or a bundle of patents. Copyrights, um, it's a little different. This is a so-called income approach. I have a very simplified example here. 
um, an author has produced a book, and in the first year it sells 5 million copies, in the second year it sells 10 million copies, in the third year its popularity has waned a bit, so it now sells only 5 million copies. The retail price was $20 US per book throughout, and the royalty rate was 10% when the sales were low, and it went up to 15% when the sales were higher. And by the way, this is very common. Um, many agreements have a provision allowing for a higher royalty rate if sales uh, are at a higher number. Um, that works out to royalties per book of two or three dollars. Um, total royalty revenue by multiplying the royalty rate by the number of books sold. Then using a process of discounting those cash flows back, we um, see what the present value of those numbers is and get to a net present value of that copyright of that author's work of US uh, $38.8 million. Um, very straightforward example. Um, in many cases, it would run out for a longer period of time than three years, but again, I'm simplifying for this purpose. Trade secrets, um, they're done in a slightly different manner. And here, it's looking at the value of the trade secret if one maintains the trade secret versus the value if one is unable to main the trade secret. And this is known as a with and a without analysis, with the trade secret, without the trade secret. So in this example, the total market size for the product, whatever it is, it's just an imaginary product for this exercise, is two million units per year. And the market share with a trade secret is 100%. No one else has the trade secret, no one else is able to produce this product. Without the trade secret, let's assume that it's 50%. The price per unit with the trade secret might be very high, $200. Without the trade secret, because there's a competitor or there are several competitors in the market, it could be only $100. So the total revenue with the trade secret could be $400 million US. Without the trade secret, it could be as little as US 100 million. Um, put a royalty rate on that, and again, the royalty will vary depending on whether there's exclusivity with the trade secrets or without, 5%. And that comes up to a total market value with the trade secret of 40 million, without the trade secret of 5 million. And that means that the trade secrets are worth $35 million, $40 million minus $5 million. Domain names and URLs. Um, I mentioned earlier that these are very valuable. Again, we're gonna use a market approach like we did with patents. And this is data that is actually taken from um, a compilation of more than 500 domain name and URL transactions that have taken place. You'll notice at the top of the list that the highest value transaction ever was US dollars 13 million for the sex.com website. I, I'm not making this up, that really happened. There were other high value transactions as well, but none as high as that. Um, $11 million for Hotels.com. FB for $8.5 million. This was purchased by Facebook to um, be the um, abbreviation of their name. Diamonds.com, Casino.com, and so on. And if one goes down through this list of 500, you'll see also many lower valued uh, URLs here. Beauty.com, Local.com. And um, our data trails off with a market value for the lowest valued domain names of about uh, US $100,000. But there have been, as I said, more than 500 transactions over a period of years. And just like valuing the patents, we would look at the individual domain name or URL that is being valued and compare that to a number of others where there had been transactions and try to come up with similarities. And this is an exercise that we really do just in the last few weeks, I was asked to value a derivative of the Napster uh, domain name. Uh, you remember Napster from the uh, music file sharing service of a few years ago. Customer relationships. I said this is often one of the highest value assets inside a company. Um, the, the way to typically value these is again an income approach. Um, we would look at the value of the company's revenues over a period of time going forward. We would look at what share of that is attributable to the existing customer relationships. And you'll notice here that there is a smaller and smaller share 
of the revenue attributable to the existing customer relationships. That's because the company will continually be working to add new customer relationships all the time. So uh, several years from now, there will still be some portion of revenues coming from existing customers, but there will be another portion of revenues coming from new customers. That's inevitable in every company. Um, we would figure out what the revenue is and the operating income to be derived from those customer relationships, and um, that would be uh, put on an after-tax basis. And then a series of what are called contributory asset charges would be taken. And these are charges for the use of the other intangible assets of the company, the trade name, the, uh, the technology, um, and things of that sort to come up with what are called excess earnings, and that is the cash flows that are attributable to those existing customer relationships. And again, like we do in the other examples where we're using an income approach, we put these numbers on a net present value basis. We bring their value back to the present by discounting them at uh, a discount rate, and that means in the end that they have a net present value in this example of US $10 million. Last but not least are the people who make it happen inside a company. Um, that would be the skilled workforce. This is the only um, intangible asset where it is common to use the cost or the asset approach. Everything else that I've shown you until now was either the market approach for the domain names and URLs on the one hand and patents on the other hand, or an income approach for customer relationship here is the replacement cost. What would it take to replace people? So um, if we look at executives or our managers or engineers or sales and marketing people, we would look at the cost to recruit replacements. We would look at the cost to train replacements. We would figure out what that is and then compile um, a simple addition of those numbers to come up with the value for the skilled workforce. I mentioned earlier that there is an unknown element in every one of these calculations as well, and that's goodwill. And so what is goodwill? In the very simplest of terms, it is a subtraction. If you look at the total value of the entity or the transaction which has just taken place, and you subtract from it the known values of the other intangible assets, and as you saw from my remarks earlier, we can develop values for a lot of these other assets. So subtract the value of the technology, the customer relationships, the trade name, the workforce, anything else for which we've developed a, uh, a real value. And everything that's left over is called goodwill. And this appears on companies' uh, balance sheets. It's a real accounting item, even though it is simply a subtraction. And um, it is part of the thinking of uh, just about every transaction involving technology assets, especially intangible assets. So um, to close out my remarks, I'd like to speak briefly about how these values are used. There's got to be a reason that people like me, with 30 years of experience in uh, Silicon Valley, are asked to perform these sorts of valuations quite routinely. And I will tell you, my firm does about 500 valuations every year of technology companies and collections of intangible assets and so on. So there, there is a lot of demand for knowledge about these valuations. Um, the most common uses are for financial reporting, for dealing with the tax authorities here in the native country and abroad with foreign governments, in mergers and acquisitions. It is a very large part of the discussion of most mergers and acquisitions. What is the value of the intangible assets being acquired? Remember, I said earlier that half the market value of most software, communications, and pharmaceutical companies is attributable to intangible assets. So the buyers want to know what they're getting for their hard-earned dollars. And finally, um, when people disagree, there frequently is a need for valuation in connection with litigation. So let me speak briefly about each of these. In financial reporting, th this is just taken from the balance sheet of a large European company. It doesn't even matter which one it is. But you'll see here that there is a record of an acquisition. And um, you'll notice down 
uh, part way down, the fair value of the acquired, the acquired intangible assets. Those would be the technology, the trade name, and things of that sort. And then a little further down at the, towards the bottom of that group is goodwill. So um, 112, I'm sorry, uh, 12 million euros um, uh, applied to the, uh, the known intangibles and about the same amount, 12 million euros, applied to the goodwill. Um, this is an example of a very complex tax transaction which my firm Technos valued. Um, it was about the movement of assets offshore and the various boxes in that decision tree have to do with the timing of when patents are granted and when markets are opened up and things like that. The details of it don't matter, but this is the sort of analysis that we perform. In this case, we ran what's called a Monte Carlo analysis to simulate um, the sorts of decision activity that would uh, go on here. And this was presented to the U.S. Internal Revenue Service, and in the end, uh, they bought off on the value that we determined. Mergers and acquisitions, I mentioned already, a lot of the value of uh, technology-driven companies is contained in intangible assets, and there's a lot of time spent at the table working out what the values are and how they will be treated on financial statements, how they will be treated for tax purposes going forward. So my firm is frequently pulled into merger and acquisition negotiations to sort out issues that come up during the discussions to help establish what the treatment of these intangible assets will be after the transaction is completed and so on. And then finally, as I said, um, in some cases, people will disagree. Uh, there are sometimes lawsuits that stem from merger deals that have gone bad. More frequently, there is litigation in connection with infringement of intellectual property. So a violation of someone's intangible assets. Um, you can easily imagine patent infringement litigation, such as the kind that has been going on for years now between Apple and Samsung, or between uh, Oracle, which bought Sun Microsystems, and Google. Um, these are lawsuits that involve hundreds of millions of US dollars, if not billions of dollars. And there are um, well-paid valuation experts, people like me, who go up and present detailed analyses that the court either accepts or rejects or takes on a modified basis. So to summarize with a remark that I made earlier, um, the intangible economy is very important. Developed countries are increasingly dependent on the production of intangible goods to create wealth. You remember that chart that I showed you with intangible assets rising while tangible asset investment is falling. And I think that that speaks to the future. The value of intangible assets is going to be a driver of economies of the world throughout uh, going forward. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, sir. Maybe My question is related to human talent. Currently, Latin American countries, and particularly Colombia, are undergoing an explosion of human talent. And the evidence is this event, 3.0, which has been attended by very talented people and creative people. Could you expand on the concept of valuation of human talent within all this work that you... That, that's, that's a very pertinent question. <laughs> Unfortunately, most accounting standards, US GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, and um, IASB, which produce um, the worldwide equivalent uh, for the rest of the world, um, do not allow the um, imputation of much value to human resources. Um, this is an interesting anachronism, but uh, the example that I showed you and the numbers that I showed you are all too often typical of the values that are placed on the human assets. It's thought that um, people are replaceable. Um, I, I disagree uh, 
Um, I've actually been working with some of the authorities to try and change that particular uh, treatment. But right now, when most valuations are done of intangible assets, you would find that um, 98 or 90 percent of the value is attributable to technology, brand name, customer relationships, and things of that sort. And only one or two percent of the value would be attributed to the human employees. I think that this is contradicted by the real evidence. Um, there are a number of companies in Silicon Valley which are making um, what are called aqua hires, which is a combination of the word of acquisition and hiring. They're buying companies simply to get their hands on the talented developers, the engineers, the managers who built up those companies. But right now, um, valuation methodology and accounting treatment are falling behind the reality on the ground. I, I hope that they'll catch up, but it's probably going to be a several year process before they do so. I do have one question in English. Um, I would like to know what are the techniques or methods to evaluate uh, domains? I mean, because uh, theoretically it sounds like a, I, no, I, I don't know, so I'll let you answer. <laughs> Pardon. Gracias. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did not hear the question. The, what are the techniques of valuation of domains? How, how, how are you settings, uh, or how do you set value of domain? If somebody is selling the domain, or yes. no, no, if not, not selling, selling company with the domain. Right. So then how do you, how do you set the price of the domain? If, if you don't really sell, uh, if it's part of the company and you don't sell uh, domain separately? Because um, they're tip, they're tip uh, the question is how does one value a domain name as part of an entire transaction? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, the, um, the two most common methods are the one which I showed you on the screen, which is to look at the value of other domain names and, and using um, a market approach, attempt to estimate the value of the domain name um, that's at hand. And the other is to, to do um, a cash flow example, an income approach of the income that is attributable to that domain name. Um, the, because um, the rise of the internet is relatively recent, I mean, 1995, so um, there's been a lot of activity really only in the last decade. And like I said a, a moment ago in my remarks about the skilled workforce, the valuation and accounting um, principles often fall behind or, or lag behind what's happening in the marketplace. Um, there hasn't been a lot of attention to this. I mentioned that we have a database of about 500 domain names where there have been transactions. Um, that's growing steadily day by day. Um, as it grows, it'll become richer and deeper and more useful to us. But right now, we're, we're limited in some cases to some pretty clumsy tools. Eh, buenas, yo quería preguntar eh, si podíamos profundizar un poquito más en el concepto de goodwill y su valoración. Muchas gracias. Um, I'm afraid that there's no more depth to goodwill, um, the calculation of the value of goodwill than what I showed you. It really is just a subtraction. So one begins with the value of the company or the value of the transaction and takes out the things which are known, and one is left with what is unknown, and the whole of what is unknown is just given that generic name, goodwill. Um, it, it's a bit of a catch-all. It's meant to, to throw together everything that can't be valued. I, I can try and give you one slightly more specific example. It's common to value uh, long-term customer relationships. You'll remember in my slides I had the example of the truck backed up to the factory. Um, where the cash flows are fairly well known, they're predictable, we can develop a value. But in the preceding slide, the gentleman at the counter serving employees, I'm sorry, serving customers as they stepped up and they're paying in cash, we have no way of knowing who those customers are. 
We don't know if they'll be back again tomorrow and the next day and a year from now. There's no value attributed to that, typically. The, but how, the value is not forgotten entirely. It's included in goodwill. So goodwill is meant to be those things which we can't readily identify, but which still have value in a transaction or in a company. Is there any information from users? I am talking about opinions and skills through the social networks. This information could be valued from the standpoint of the legislation. Does it have any value? That, that is a very good question. Um, it's actually one which um, a number of authorities are pursuing right now. For instance, um, there are uh, governmental tax authorities who are very interested in the value of intangible assets that are moved offshore as part of a, um, um, an attempt to avoid taxes in a given regime. And so when um, uh, the members of a, face, of a, a Facebook or another social network um, are accumulated in a foreign country, there's a question to the host country, in the case of Facebook, it would be United States government, um, do those users have value to the U.S. Um, parent company? Is there a means of getting at that value? And um, this is up in the air right now. It's, it's currently being discussed in a handful of cases, not necessarily Facebook, I, I'm just using that as a generic example, but in a handful of cases, it's actually being pursued um, in litigation. Yes, What happens when you want to start calculating uh, intangibles when you still do not have contact with customers? You have not service customers, customer service or market share. The only intangible value that you have is the skilled workforce. Um, another good question. Um, we're faced with that issue a lot at young companies where they don't yet have a product that's ready for market and as a consequence they don't yet have um, customers. Um, you're right, there's value in the workforce there, but there's often also value in the technology, even if the technology has not been completed to um, the point where there's a developed product that's being shipped. So um, if the technology is 75% completed, we can still put a value on that presuming that, they'll, that it will be completed. We may do um, a, what's called a tree analysis and have branches of the tree with a probability of completion on time and a probability that it won't be completed on time. And so we basically probability weight the outcome for the risk of completion. There are ways of getting at value even for very, very young companies, the proverbial three people and a dog working in a garage. Hello. How can you quantify the lifetime value of a customer that has just signed, um, let's say he's just got an intention of buying your product, but you don't know if he will buy it? Yeah. So um, how can one value the relationship of a customer where there's not a long-term contract or perhaps there's not even a contract? There is a fair bit of work done looking at past behavior, not just by one customer, but all customers. So basically we use the, te the, the techniques of statistical analysis, regression, and um, we fit uh, what are called Weeble curves, um, Iowa survivor life curves, very technical answer, I, I'm sorry. Um, but we fit life curves to it so we know how fast customer relationships have fallen off in the past. So we'll look at the past five years, and perhaps 80% of the customers five years ago went on to buy the next year, and maybe 70% of those went on to buy the third year, and so on. So we're already down below 50% of the original starting customers. We look at data of that sort and apply it to the customer base that exists at the time of the valuation or the time of the transaction and extrapolate forward from that. 
Buenas tardes. Eh, nosotros somos una compañía .com y nos gustaría saber de qué manera se puede conseguir información acerca de inversionistas que quieran eh, hacer negocios con compañías .com desarrolladas ya eh, de cinco años de trabajo. Um, the, um, the network of venture capitalists in the United States, um, I think, is the, the deepest in the world. Um, historically, there has been a prohibition against investing outside the United States. So most venture capital investors had a rule of no foreign investments. That's been relaxed in the last 10 years because of the rise of young companies. First of all, in some very big countries, uh, China and India come to mind, and now more recently in other emerging economies. Um, I've seen um, in my own practice a good 10 or 12 companies from Latin America come to me just in the last year. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I came to this conference when I received the invitation. I thought, there's got to be something going on here if companies are reaching out to me in Silicon Valley when I've never done any publicity, any marketing in Latin America and asking for my assistance. And venture capitalists in the United States are aware of this as well. Um, unfortunately, venture capitalists are very well defended. They, um, they're besieged. Um, they're being presented with hundreds and hundreds of ideas every year. The best way in is through someone who the venture capitalist knows already, um, uh, what's called a known referral source. And um, there are a number of US law firms um, which are operating down here. There are a number of um, foreign law firms which have now opened offices in the United States. They have very close working relationships with the venture capitalists, as do a few other types of firms, such as investment banks and the like. And my recommendation is to get to know one of these known referral sources prove that you're credible, and then have that firm make introductions to the U.S. venture community. Um, if you go in with a, a referral, um, you're introduced from a known source, your odds are very much higher of getting a reading, getting someone to actually look at your business plan and want to take a meeting, want to have a discussion with you, than if you just send it in unsolicited. Hi. Um I'm creating a design company and uh, a design agency and I have a very particular question about clients because there's a difference between having the client as the dry cleaner from the corner yes. from, uh, compared to having as a client Coca-Cola. And I'm guessing that depending on the type of clients you also have, the value of your company will also rise or low. But in that, those particular cases, are they measured? And if they're measured, how are they measured? Well, I, I don't know that having um, short-term and therefore relatively unidentifiable customers is going to be um, a barrier to obtaining a high value. And um, I'll hold up for you the example of Google, um, because in many cases, Google does not know who you are when you make a, an inquiry. It may have an IP address. It may have nothing more than a, a country location. And yet, um, you are intensely valuable to Google when you make your query, particularly if you're making a query against which it can serve ads. So um, it's not necessarily the case that short-term versus long-term makes a difference. It just makes a difference in classification, and it makes a difference into which bucket one goes, whether it's into customer relationships or goodwill. Well, I want to thank you. You've been a, a very warm and receptive audience, and I've enjoyed my time in Bogota. Thank you.